So I just wanted to update you on the amazing Sunday that we had last week. Many of you are wondering, okay, how did it work out after everybody, you know, sponsored children? So I wanted you to know that over 300 kids were sponsored last week. It's just what a, what a blessing that is. I think there are eight packets left uh, that Pastor Naomi has in the north lobby, I, and I know they're not going to last long, so if you just weren't able to make it, but you wanted to sponsor a child, speak to her about that, and she can tell you what to do. But I did wanna encourage you, this is very, very important, if you took home a packet, uh, or you took a packet, and you have not yet filled out the information, or you haven't done the QR code thing, so please, uh, one of two things. Either, if you intend on sponsoring that child, please do that right away so that they know that that child is taken care of. Or if the Lord's like, you know, this just isn't the right time for me, I was excited about it, but it's not good, please return the packet. You can either bring it to the office during the week or at the, at the latest, please, next Sunday. And the reason for that is there aren't duplicate packets per child floating around. There's one packet. So what happens is administratively, it's like, you know, they don't, they don't know what's going on and the, there could be a delay in them getting out a new packet and the child getting sponsored. So either, you know, go ahead and sponsor, that's great, but no judgment at all. If you, if just not the right time, please, please, please bring that packet back. But I also wanted to let you know what is happening with our effort to build and rebuild that mother church in Nicaragua. So our goal is $80,000, which will rebuild that whole thing, and already there is almost $70,000 that has come in. Thank you, Jesus, for that. So we're almost there. I just wanted to tell you, I really, I should never be amazed, because God does what he does in incredible ways, and he moves on your hearts and you just impress me with your trust in the Lord. I just want you to know that. You minister to me how much you trust the Lord in these things. God is using you in powerful ways. So this week, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have some radical faith looking at Elisha. And this is week two of our study of the life of Elisha, radical faith. Two weeks ago, we talked about, this Pastor Glenn brought a great message two weeks ago on Elisha about burning plows, anything that might be holding us back from following God and moving forward for his plan for our lives. You just gotta burn it. So burning plows. And this week, we're gonna be talking about digging ditches. Yeah, we're gonna dig some ditches. I know, it's like the thing that your parents and grandparents are like, you got to make sure you prepare properly for life, otherwise you'll be digging ditches. Well, we're going to dig some ditches today. We're going to talk about it, but let's pray first. Father, we want to thank you so much for your word, your amazing word. These scriptures bring life to us. Father, we want to honor your word right now by praying that you would anoint our hearts to receive what you have to say. May there be seeds that are planted and grow and flourish into trees of life. In Jesus' name, amen. I also want to say a big welcome. to Those of you who are here for the very first time today, would you just lift your hand if you're here for the first time because we want to applaud for you. Thank you for being here. God bless you. And we also want to welcome all of those who are watching online, people in this community, people across the country, people in other countries around the world. Welcome if you're watching online. Can we just welcome them right now? We love you, you're part of this family. All right, here's, here's a serious question for a minute. How many of you have ever pondered about your life and thought, if only? You know what I'm saying? If only. If only I had a better job where maybe I didn't have to work with X, Y, or Z. <laughs> I didn't have to work for this person. If only I had a better job. Or how about 
if only I had more money. You know, there was that billion dollar lottery and if only I had won it, then, oh man, I could do so much good. My life would be so much different. I mean, why wasn't it me? Or if only God would answer this one specific prayer, and I've been praying this prayer for 20 years, you would think that God would answer it by now. Or if only I had a wife. Or if only I had a husband. Or if you have a husband, if only I had a husband with a job. <laughs> or I got a husband with a job, but if only I had a husband that looked like Denzel Washington or Dwayne Johnson. Just to be clear, uh, that's not me. I'm not looking for a husband. I just, it's an illustration. But it's so easy <laughs> to look at what you don't have instead of appreciating what we do have. It's just easy to do. But today, as you're listening to the message I want you to listen through the lens of your greatest need, of that thing in your life. It's like, man, if only. I want you to keep that in the forefront of your mind because we're addressing that through scripture. But first, we're gonna look at the context of the message today. And of course, it, it's relating to Elisha because that's the series that we're in. And the context of, this is the 800s BC, and there are three kings, there are three kings, the king of Israel, which is the king of the northern 10 tribes of, of God's people who had gone off the rails. And then there's the king of Judah, which are the southern two tribes. And then there's also the king of Edom, which is a related kingdom that's nearby. And these three kings join forces to do battle against the Moabites. So it's like three against one, right? Easy. There's like no way they could lose. But then the unexpected hits these three kings and their three armies. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but life is full of the unexpected. We're just cruising along, everything's going like we planned, and then boom, something can hit. I remember uh, my grandfather, when my grandfather came to this country from Cuba, from Santiago de Cuba, in 1948, he came because there, there was an engineering, a nice engineering job waiting for him in San Diego, California. And so he, he speaks English perfectly, but he's bringing his wife who speaks no English, my grandmother, and his two boys who speak no English, and they hop over to Miami where they have family to visit until he starts his job. And then he gets word, actually the job's no longer available. <laughs> It fell through. So here he is in this new country with family that doesn't even speak English. And what's he going to do? The unexpected hit. And just so you're not left hanging, he did, he got a job doing draftsman work and he eventually became an engineer. And, and yeah, his oldest boy married my mom and that's why I'm here, because of the unexpected that happened. I'm glad. But... <laughs> So but here's these three kings, right? And instead of winning easily, they find their troops marching through the desert for seven days, and they've run out of water. They have no water, neither for their troops nor for their animals that they need to carry their stuff. They are in deep trouble. So they had a specific need, in this case, water to drink, just like many of us. And this leads us to our first thought in your notes. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. Believe it or not, that greatest need, which seems like such a curse, can be such a blessing when it actually drives us to depend on him. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter three. We'll start at verse nine. So the king of Israel, his name was Joram, he was a bad dude. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah, his name was Jehoshaphat, he was a good dude sometimes, 
and the king of Edom. I don't know what his name was. So after a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. What? Explain the king of Israel. This is Joram. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? This is so funny because the text doesn't say the Lord asked them to do this at all. This was like his idea. And now he's blaming God. It's just, anyway. But Jehoshaphat, this is the okay king of Judah, he asks, well, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we might inquire of the Lord? And an officer of the king of Israel answered, well, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, Elisha was mentored by Elijah. That's what pouring water on his hands is talking about. And so one of the miracles that happened with Elijah, this is the, this is the mentor, was during a great drought and there was no water for anybody and Elijah prayed and a, and a cloud appeared in the sky. It was just the size of a man's hand, a little cloud out in the distance and then a great storm cloud came from it and brought relief to the people suffering from the droughts. So they're like, hey, all right, we can get some rain. So back to the text, verse 12. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So these three kings, first of all, they're not following God. They're not really seeking after him but they knew they needed to find someone who was close to God, and surely they had heard of the great miracles, not only that happened by Elisha's mentor, but by Elisha himself that God did. For example, one time, Elisha, he had already split the Jordan River. One time, he spoke to a polluted spring. This is not like polluted like it has beer cans in it. This is polluted like if you drink from it, you die, spring. And he prayed, and, and that water was made healthy. You know, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's one story with Elisha where these youths were disrespecting him and calling him Baldy. I guess he was bald. Baldy, Baldy. And then two bears show up and ruin the party. <laughs> one thing about Elisha, he was not known for his successful youth ministry. He barely had a youth ministry. Uh, I'm sorry. I might get in trouble for that. But, you know, so he had kind of an attitude sometimes. And you know how you learn from your mentor? You learn from your mentor. Like, Pastor Glenn, for decades, has been my mentor in ministry. And there are certain things that are just important to his heart that have transferred to my heart. For example, you know, he just loves to stand, even though he's an introvert, he loves to stand at the door and greet y'all as you come in the church. And I'm like, I love it too. It's just something that we share, and that's because he's mentored that into me. There, there just aren't, I don't know, there might be, but I don't know of a, another large church where the pastor stands at the door. Not that there's anything wrong with these other churches, there's reasons for that, good reasons for that, but it's just kind of the thing we love to do. Another thing is he really believes in not trying to be someone else when you preach. You know, and we had this amazing founding pastor. And so when he became our lead pastor, he just felt, Lord, speaking to him, don't try to be like the founding pastor. Be yourself. And so he has encouraged that and mentored that into me. It's like, Tim, I don't want you to try to be like me. Why would you? You're a nerd. So just own it and be your nerdy self. And it's just, I love that, right? I love that. He also has in his heart, one thing that really irritates him is when somebody messes with you. When somebody messes with our church people, it just irritates him. And so when somebody messes with you, I've taken that on too. It's like, man, that really bothers me. Well, so when the kings asked for Elisha, to help them, he takes on something that Elijah had, and he kind of cops this attitude with them. 
So Elijah, his mentor. You, I don't know if you remember the time when Elijah challenged 450 false prophets of the false god Baal or Baal. And they were worshiping him and they're like, Baal's better than your god Yahweh. And he's like, all right, here's the deal. This is what we're gonna do. I'll set up an altar to the Lord and you can set up an altar to your false god over there and we'll both pray and whichever one fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, we'll know that's the true God and you can go first. And they're, so they're like putting kindling and oil and flammable stuff and they start praying to Baal and they're like dancing around for hours, they're cutting themselves, they're doing everything they can think of and, and while they're praying and crying out to the God of Baal, to God Baal Elijah, he, he kind of starts to make fun of them. That's in the Bible. He says, well, maybe your God's hard of hearing. You know what? He's probably just on vacation. And that's, you know, he even says, he's like, maybe your God is relieving himself right now. and Just is indisposed. And they're fine. They finally, they give up. All right, how about, and he pours water all over the altar of the Lord, just make it as little flammable as possible, and praise, and the fire from heaven comes down and consumes the sacrifice, and consumes the 450 prophets of Baal. So he has this attitude, and Elisha understands it. So let's look at the text, how Elisha carries us through. Chapter three, starting at verse 13. Elisha said to the king of Israel, why do you wanna involve me? You go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Okay, this is what he's talking about. <laughs> Joram's mother was Jezebel, <laughs> right? His father was Ahab. They were the ones that had those 450 prophets of Baal. So he's like, go to your prophets. Why, do you, why are you asking for the prophet of the Lord? It's an attitude. So no, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into into the hands of Moab, lie. Okay, so Elisha said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. So Jehoshaphat, from time to time, he really did serve the Lord. He, he had a heart, it was a little wishy-washy, but he did have a heart for God. So he's like, I'm gonna help you because of him. But first, Elisha, has this request, 2 Kings 3.15. He says, but now bring me a harpist. You want me to prophesy? I need some mood music. <laughs> so actually prophets often, this is common, they wanted to be in a place of worship to position themselves to hear from God. So the kings are like, okay, we know how this rolls. Prophet asks for music. They're about to give us a word of great encouragement. Whew. Here we go. Good things are gonna happen. And here's what Elisha says. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him and he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. It tells him to dig ditches. Can you imagine what these three kings must have thought? I mean, Think, remember, their troops are exhausted after traveling seven days in the desert. They are out of water. They're parched. And now they have to do manual labor and dig ditches. So remember, your greatest need becomes a blessing when it pushes you to depend on God. Second Kings chapter three, verse 17. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain. Isn't this encouraging? No rain. Yet, this valley will be filled with water and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, and he'll also deliver Moab into your hands. So what is he asking you to dig ditches for? Because... God is interested in their faith, and he's interested in their faith that actually gets put into practice, faith that works. 
Faith is, that is effective, faith that is active, knowing that when we take a step of faith towards God, he's gonna step towards us and our needs. In your notes, only God can send the water. But sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. This is, I think, what James is talking about. This story and stories like it are in James's mind. James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he writes in a New Testament letter to believers, chapter two, verse 26, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. It's like you, you say you believe, that's nice, you believe. But if that belief doesn't show up in your life and the things you do, it's dead, it's not alive. Only God can send the water. But he wants to see us actually dig the ditches. And he's saying, show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. And often our prayers are, are all kind of centered around, Lord, I need this. You said you were gonna be faithful. I really, really need this, God. Be faithful to me. And he's like, yes, I am faithful. Show me your faith. Show me your faith. This is why Jesus kept bringing this up. Often he would say that statement. He says, when I saw their faith, your faith has healed you. What's he talking about there? You remember, if you've been watching The Chosen and you're caught up, you, you know about this. But if you've been reading the Bible too, you know this situation when Jesus and his, Jesus' disciples are out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They're rowing across. A storm comes up, and they're just like foundering. I mean, it's like, what are they gonna do? They're in a boat in a stormy sea, and they see this figure like walking in the water. First, they think it's a ghost because, you know, normally people don't walk on water. And then they recognize, wait, I think it's Jesus. And, and Peter says, if it's, if it's you, then, then call to me and I'll walk out to you. And, and it is Jesus. And Jesus says, come. And Peter's like, okay. <laughs> and he's, he actually steps out of the boat into the sea and starts walking on the water to Jesus. And Peter gets distracted. He looks around him and says, wait a minute, this isn't possible, <laughs> right? Wind and waves. And he starts to sink and Jesus pulls him up. He says, well, come on, man, where's your faith? It's like, yes, just take a step of faith. Many times we see where God wants us to actually participate in the miracle. It's still a miracle, but he wants us to be a part of this. This is, if you read the Bible, God is just so passionate about including people in his miracles. He could do everything that he wants just by himself. He doesn't need people, but he loves and he's passionate about working with humans. That's why we're his images. So like in the New Testament, there was a, a dude with a withered hand. And Jesus could have just said, hand is healed. It's healed. But instead he goes, stretch out your hand. He wanted him to do something. He wanted him to participate. And when he did that, he was healed. Or, I don't know if you remember that time that he came up to a man who hadn't walked in years and years and years. And Jesus could have just snapped his fingers and walked away, he's healed, but Jesus said, I want you to get up and take up your mat and walk. He wanted him to have some, he wanted him to dig a ditch. Once there was a blind man that Jesus went to. And Jesus, this time, is quite interesting. He actually spit in the dirt and then made a mud and rubbed it in the guy's eyes. And then he says, well, I want you to do is go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes out there. And then he was healed. He did that because he wanted the guy to make a trip to the pool and wash his eyes. He wanted him to dig a ditch. Jesus was saying, I'm gonna do my part, but I want, me, I want you to show your faith. You're doing something. So a lot of people are waiting on God to move they haven't dug a ditch. They haven't stepped out in faith. A lot of people want to quit smoking. I don't know what that first step of faith looks like. That God, maybe it's, I'm going to throw out all my cigarettes and waste all that money. Just throw them out. 
Maybe that's the step. Maybe there's an area in your life where there's just a relationship that's just so bad and there's so much mutual unforgiveness and just all kinds of crazy stuff going on and it gnaws at you sometimes when you think about it. And maybe digging that ditch is showing that person forgiveness and grace when they haven't asked for it and they've got nothing but meanness towards you. Maybe you're like, I just want my kids to know Jesus. I want them to not make the mistakes I made. And maybe digging that ditch is modeling grace for them in your interactions with other people. Not speaking ill of others, but lifting them up, even if, you know, I think that person's crazy. I'm gonna lift them up in front of my kids. I'm gonna speak well of them because it's gonna send a message to them. I'm gonna love other people instead of having a critical spirit. Maybe make church non-negotiable. It's like, you know, on Sundays, we're going to church. (laughs) This is what we do. Maybe Wednesday too, all of us. We're going. If you want water, dig the ditch. There's a lot of people that say, you know, I just, I want more money is what I want. Then be faithful with your tithes. Dig the ditch. Because God will bless that 90%, but we have to step out in faith and do our part. Some of you single guys, you're just sitting at home, praying that God will send you a wife. You're praying, Lord, just send her to the door, have her ring the doorbell, I'll take off my headphones, stop playing my video game and get up, (laughs) go to the door, A smoking hot wife is not just gonna come and knock on your door and say, okay, let's go to church. Take a shower first. Brush your teeth. Maybe get in a men's Bible study where there's no ladies. It's just you're you're digging your ditch. You're getting closer to Jesus. Grow to be a godly man. And then you then you just watch and see what God does. Dig the ditch. So I know somebody was starting to clap back there. I know it's probably a thing with you. I get it. I get it. It's a thing. When I met Thalia, this is over 20 years ago now. We just celebrated our our 19th wedding anniversary, end of January. So we were both coming here to Countryside and and I was invited to be a part of this leadership group of a ministry, and she was already invited to be a part of the leadership group. We were having our first meeting. There were about 12 of us, met at this pizza place, sitting around the table. And of course, I, I saw Thaley. I'd seen her in the church before. I, you know, I'd never spoken to her, but I've seen her. And then the pastor of this ministry said, so um, Thalia here is gonna be in charge of follow-up, but she does need some help. Would anyone like to volunteer? I had to dig a ditch, right? So some of you, it's been a couple of years since I've I've described Thaley and so forth. Just so you know, some of you who are newer, uh, she is over the early childhood area and she's over all of our amazing army of volunteers that watch our little ones, our preschoolers. So if you ever want to see what Pastor Tim's wife, who Pastor Tim's wife is, it's very easy. You wander over there and look for the one who looks exactly like Tinkerbell. She does, I mean, it's no kidding. People think I'm joking, but then, like the last time I said this, people are like, Pastor Tim, she really does look like Tinkerbell. I had no trouble identifying her. She, she's amazing, she's so beautiful, and then the people will say, so, um, how did you end up with her? Does she have like vision issues or, or something? Only God, (laughs) only God can send the water. Sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. And finally, real faith believes big, but it's willing to start small. In the book of Zechariah, this prophet, chapter four, verse 10, 
He writes, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Because I know a lot of you, you have a big vision and that's good, you have a big vision but you have to start small. God wants to do huge things through each of us but usually, usually it's going to start small. Pastor Glenn's dad, Clayton Davis, Years and years ago, he had this vision and, and he helped start Helping Hands, which, when it, which is us giving food to those who need food in the community. And it was just a few people when he started, it was so small. And today, it, I mean, if you drive, three days a week, if you drive by, you're like, what are all those cars doing lined up in the church parking lot all in a line? Over 150 families each day, three days a week, were able to give 50 pounds of food each to. This is your doing, you're doing this, right? This is God using you. But you see how it started small, and now it grew into something beautiful because he dug a ditch. Countryside, this church started with seven people in the living room. You've heard Pastor Glenn say this in 1981. Lots and lots of ditches were dug through the years. God has shown himself true time and time again from seven people in the living room to this past Christmas Eve. There's more people we've ever had in the history of the church. Right now, on a regular Sunday morning, we're running more people than we've ever had on a regular Sunday morning in the history of this church, but it's because of God answering. He's faithful. He's faithful when we show our faith. And some of you here today, you have big needs. And I want to encourage you, have faith. Have faith. Because God is more than able to meet that need. Maybe there's just a ditch that you need to dig. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 20. So this is what happens. So the next morning, next morning, about the time for the offering of the sacrifice, there it was. Water flowing, no rain, but water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. They dug ditches, and God came through. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. Only God can send the water. Sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch, and real faith believes big, but it's willing to start small. So Jesus was out preaching and multitudes gathered to hear him. And as he's speaking, 5,000 dudes are there with their families. And Jesus is kind of compelling to listen to, so they stay all day and into the next day. The thing is, is they, didn't, they didn't have food. They didn't have food. And the disciples come to Jesus more than one gospel talks about this, and it's like, we gotta send them home or something because they're getting really hungry. And Jesus says, you feed them. <laughs> okay, uh, with what? And so they're like, okay, Jesus said, feed them. He didn't like snap his fingers and create, he just says, go feed them. What do we do? And there's this one boy, in John chapter six, we find out there's this boy, he's got, he's got five little barley loaves and, and a couple of fish, and he's like, here. And Andrew comes and says, okay, Andrew is Peter's brother. He says, Jesus, we got, we got five barley loaves and two fish. There's thousands of people. And Jesus is like, yeah, I can work with that. And he prayed over it, blessed it. Starts giving it out and feeds 5,000 dudes and their families with five little barley loaves and two fish to where they had more than enough. They were full and 12 baskets full of scraps left over. Now Jesus didn't have to take that little boy's food. He could have created all that out of thin air. But it was a ditch. This little kid was willing to dig didn't just bless him, it blessed thousands of people around him. That's why we're digging ditches, it's not just for us. It shouldn't be. 
is for all the people around us. He wants to use us powerfully. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Nobody looking around. It's kind of a moment between you and, and God. I want to I be clear. This is not about earning your salvation because the Bible says that that's something we could never earn. There's, when we do wrong, and all of us have, what we do is we create this chasm between us and the Father. And all the shovelfuls of our good works can never fill in. So God himself cross that chasm and he did it. He made a bridge for us. Three nails and two pieces of wood. And his own son gave his life and took on himself all the consequences of, of our wrongs and all the pain and all the cruelty upon himself crushed the head of the serpent so that we could have that clean relationship with the Father, and then he gives it to us as a gift just to say, I trust you, please forgive me, Lord. I believe you died for me and rose again. That's it, and it's a gift. And maybe you've never heard it put quite that way before. You just always thought you just had to work hard for God's favor. He worked hard for you to have his favor. And you wanna say, Pastor Tim, something's been tugging at my heart lately. I think it's him. Would you just... Keep me in your prayers, Pastor Tim, and I am gonna pray for you right now. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, because I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out. If that's you, when you count to three, you just slip your hand up in the air, and I'm gonna say a prayer for all of you, okay? One, two, three. Thank you, yes, thank you. Many, many hands I see. Thank you. It's quite a few. Well, Father, I just pray for those who raise their hands today. I lift them up to you. Father, you gave your son for them, for each one, for each man, for each woman, for each child. And I pray, Lord, that they would come to know your incredible love today. And they would receive you and your forgiveness in their hearts in Jesus' name. So all of us in this room together, can we say a prayer for the sake of those who just raised their hands? And even if you prayed this prayer before, just so that they don't feel like they're praying it alone. And I wanna encourage you that if you're praying because you raised your hand, you mean this prayer sincerely in your heart. God promises in the Bible that he'll always answer yes to this. One who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So would you all pray with me? Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I know I've done wrong, but you sent your son to die for me. Forgive me my sins. Please give me this new life. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. This day I give you my life and I make you Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, and my God in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we praise God right now? So if you would, if you would stand now to receive your blessing, and we're gonna dismiss right after this blessing, and if the altar prayer team would come to the front, I wanna encourage you that if you pray that prayer for the first time, come see one of these altar prayer team members because we have a gift for you. It's a free book we think will really be a blessing to you. But if you want prayer for any reason, that's what our altar prayer team is for. But to receive your blessing right now, if, if you would, just open your hearts to the Lord. And if you'd like, you can even turn your palms upward in an attitude of receiving. May you be blessed this day with faith, faith in action, the strength and encouragement to dig whatever that ditch is the Lord wants you to dig. May you be blessed with the abundant faithfulness of God to answer this prayer that's on your heart. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. We love you, church. Have a wonderful Sunday.